south of England um, on a reasonably sunny day. Pleased to be here. Next is Ruth Stross. Hi everyone, I'm Ruth Stross. I'm a multiple sclerosis nurse specialist and I work with Surrey Downs Health and Care, which is basically based in Epsom. So welcome. And um, next is George Pepper. Hi, I'm George. Um, I've lived with MS for the last 15 years and I'm one of the founders of Shift.MS, which is a social network for people with MS. And finally, Sarah, would you like to say a few words, please? Hi, I'm Sarah Gillett. I'm the Managing Director of the Neurology Academy. Um, and I hope that the sessions that we are providing for everybody is helping in this um, critical time. Thank you very much. So um, just to, to walk through what the agenda is over the next hour, um, I'm going to give a short introduction that, that uh, Gavin would have given. And then Joe is going to talk to us about mental health based issues in MS uh, in this time point. George is going to talk a little bit about shift MS and we'll have a panel discussion and we'll answer some of the many questions that have come in. Then each of us will give a brief summary and finally Joe will just recap on some of the key issues from her talk. Uh, as I mentioned the main focus of this is on mental health issues so um, we won't be addressing all of the questions that we've had in but uh, they will be uh, question and answers will be available online and there will be further webinars so to uh, recap it is the 6th of April today the reason for making that statement is that guidance is often changing and recommendations are changing so Please beware of that when you um, when, when you hear guidance and and comments. Um, there have been in the UK now well over five thousand deaths, and there have been well over fifty thousand deaths internationally from the COVID nineteen disease. So this is a key issue for all of us. Um, I thought it'd be valuable to just regroup on some base terminology. So coronaviruses are a family of viruses. There's over forty of them. And they, they all share one thing, which is they have spikes on their surfaces that look like crowns, hence the corona. Um, this new virus that has caused the current pandemic is called SARS-CoV-2. SARS standing for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And it is a, it is a variant of the um, SARS causing, causing coronavirus of the 2003 epidemic. Uh, COVID-19 is the disease that it causes. Remember that if you're exposed to the virus, not everybody gets affected, and not everybody gets affected get, gets the disease. Um, and as far as the illness is, as, as we know at the moment, about 80% of people have mild symptoms. Some 15% have more severe symptoms that may require hospitalization. About 5% of people require ventilation and the mortality rate is currently running at around about two and a half percent, but is likely to uh, level out at a bit less than that over time. It's important to recognise that the risk of catching the disease is related to general factors as well as MS factors. So generally, older people are more susceptible than younger people. Men are more susceptible than women. People who are more disabled are more susceptible than people who are less disabled. And people who have more comorbidities are more susceptible than people who don't. Now, MS as a disease itself does not necessarily confer an increased risk of gaining or, or acquiring the um, COVID-19 illness. Um, but it is a risk if you have disabling symptoms and particularly those affecting respiratory function or swallowing. The other issue, of course, is the MS specific drugs, some of which can confer a risk. So I should just walk through some of those because I think that helps to answer some of the questions from uh, that were posed by uh, all of you over the last couple of days. So the beta interferons, that's Avonex, Rebif, beta seron, Xtavia and Plegridae are not considered to confer an increased risk nor is Capaxone, whether it's given daily or three times a week, or the um, generic version, which is called uh, Brabio. Teriflunamide is not considered to create an increased risk. Uh, and indeed, there is some suggestion that teriflunamide may be beneficial in the COVID-19 disease. 
DMF, BG12, or Tecfidera, as it's uh, known more widely, is also considered to be of low risk in COVID-19, unless people have low lymphocytes below 0 0.8. DMF, your lymphocyte count. Likewise, fingolimod is considered to be of a moderate risk. Um, now, that does tend to reduce people's lymphocytes. So if the lymphocytes are below 0.8, we tend to consider people as very much more vulnerable, although it is being studied as a treatment for COVID-19. And because it doesn't deplete lymphocytes, it actually sticks them in your lymph nodes, it may be a, a different story. Tysabri, natalizumab, is considered safe, uh, but people are pushing out the frequency of the injections or infusions from four weeks more to six weeks and if not to eight weeks largely because of the logistics of this in the uh, face of MS teams. Uh, ocrelizumab is considered to be of moderate to higher risk uh, particularly in the early stages after the infusion so during that first six month period and that is why the subsequent infusions have been recommended to be delayed. A cladribine again is considered of high risk in the first three to six months but after then the risk drops and that is why cladribine is being delayed. The second cycles are being delayed. Alemtuzumab, Lemtrada is also considered to be of high risk particularly in the first six months and um, Stem cell transplants are considered to be of high risk early on, but, but also for probably up to a year. Now, a lot of these issues are covered in Gavin's micro link, which is available through the Academy website. I would add that there's some interesting registry data that's been coming in from uh, Italy and from Spain, suggesting that, um, that there may be no difference in in people on DMTs versus those who aren't DMTs in the way that they handle the, the COVID disease and that MS people may not be worse off than the general population. Now I would heighten, heighten, heighten the fact that those are very early and very preliminary suggestions. So um, you have to watch that space. We would warn you that MS teams are being affected. Um, I've already mentioned that, that Gavin has been um, in charge now of a, of a COVID-19 ward since eight o'clock this morning. Uh, MS nurses are being deployed to the hospitals. So MS teams are being, um, are being changed and their, their ability to help you may be, may be affected. Uh, and therefore there really is an emphasis towards people with MS are being very proactive in terms of A, looking after themselves and B, contacting their teams. Finally, um, remember brain health issues. There is increasing evidence that vitamin D supplementation is really valuable, uh, that not smoking is important, weight management, alcohol, etc., especially during this time of heightened risk. So I will end there and I will hand over to our main event today, which is Joe. Thank you, Jeremy. And that was a really useful um, update for me, actually. Um, I'm hoping this is going to go well. Is that all right? You can see my screen? Yep, your screen's there. Um, okay, fabulous. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm aware that for some people it will be very, very early morning or even other times of the day. Um, as I said earlier, I'm a neuropsychologist, so much of my work is concerned with the mind and I actually prefer the time um, the term mind health because I think all of us have minds and we all need to um, do things to protect them so the title of my presentation is PPE for the mind interestingly this is a title I've been using for perhaps a couple of years and um, I always used to start with explaining what PPE for the mind meant because no one knew what PPE was of course now we um, we're in a different position aren't we and um, everybody knows that PPE is the clothes and the masks that we need in order to protect our bodies from disease, especially the frontline staff. So um, 
PPE feels a particularly relevant title, but I think that we also need to be thinking about how we protect our minds in times of what essentially is an anxiety crisis as much as a physical disease crisis. So we haven't got too long. So I'm aware that I need to um, just go over the frameworks, just go over the basics, but I hope it will give you um, some heads up about how to manage your mind, protect your mind in this really tricky climate. So um, here's my first slide that perhaps initially will look a bit irrelevant to the issues at hand. Um, but it's actually, bear with me, and I hope you'll see. So what I have here is eight sentences with a six-letter word missing. And it's the same six-letter word for each sentence. So um, have a think about what might complete this sentence. Knowing you're something makes life feel more meaningful, particularly in times of crisis. Knowing this helps you manage stress, be more effective, be cognitively better, improves your relationships and your physical and mental health. Right, I'm going to ask my um, executive panel, any ideas from the floor or the screen? There, there was a, there's been a suggestion over, over the, um, the chat feature. That is the missing word mind. No, it isn't, but it's a good guess. I have to say that was what my guess was as well. Okay. Well, lots of people say that or life or um, there's some good guesses. The, the actual, the answer is values. Now, when I first started training in the acceptance and commitment therapy model, which is the most up-to-date form of CBT or one of them, um, and I heard this, I thought that has to be a heap of junk. I just can't believe that that would be true. Knowing what's important, knowing who's important, helps manage all of this big stuff. But actually, the more I've um, worked within this model, the more training I've done to hundreds of people, including a lot of frontline staff like the police and nurses, but more importantly, used it in my own life, the more I realize it's absolutely very true that knowing your values helps with a range of things, particularly managing difficult feelings in times of crisis. So um, what are we thinking about when we talk about a value? Because it's another one of those misused words that became very trendy and very lip servicey in a lot of um, big organizations, a bit like mindfulness. And when it's used wrongly, it can actually be quite dangerous and misleading so what i mean when i say a value essentially is what's important to you what's important to you right now in this current climate and who is important so um, the first important thing is it's personal it's about what's important to you not what's important to me so it's not what society says so society says um, actually most of my friends that I should be very interested in the environment but I'm ashamed to say that I'm not that interested I know that's bad but that's how it is deep in my heart it's not something that captures my attention and I'm not overly fond of animals either I could easily step over them without interest again you might be gasping with shock lots of people do when I speak with live audiences but what's important to me is relationships i'm a big fan of communication um, i like supporting people being helpful giving them um, truthful information and being my authentic self which is why i'm internationally confessing that i not interested in the environment when i should be so please don't share that you know i'm hoping i'm not talking to too many people um, so um and it's also important that values are things that we express in action. If we don't express them in action, it's kind of like my dad's mobile, it never gets switched on. 
and it can't really do its job. And it's about expressing your values in the small things. So we're not talking about getting up today and going and running an international business. We're talking about making your son a cup of tea when you don't really fancy it, or texting a friend who's a bit overly needy and annoying. If you can't express it, it's not a value. So here's a few examples. So there's a few of my values that I like to bring to work. Some of them I keep when I'm out of work as well. Um, and that's my second son, very patiently explaining to my tricky nephew how to manage something on the TV screen. So they, when I asked him about what his values were in life, he gave me those ones in green. So um, we don't have too much time to pause over each slide, but this will be available for you afterwards to ponder in more detail. So at the end of the day, us flawed humans, we are either taking action. So every single thing we're doing, right down to sleeping, drinking a cup of tea, having a chat, sitting here staring at a screen, speaking into a screen. It's either gonna be a towards move or it's gonna be an away move. If it's a towards move, we're doing something that is taking us towards our values, what we've decided is important. And let me give you an example. So waking up this morning, you'll be pleased to know next to my husband in bed um, and I was thinking you know a nice towards me would be to get up before I come out to my office and make him a cup of tea and ask him if he slept well so that was all good but you know what just before I was about to um, get my leg out of bed something happened um, he did something that captured my imagination more than thinking about my values, he started to breathe. And he was breathing exceptionally loudly. You know that way that sometimes men do in quite a kind of gruffly snorty sort of breathing kind of way. And um, I, my mind got quite hijacked really by this is so irritating. How come he gets to snort and snuffle in bed when I've got to get up and go to work? And I started to feel a bit angry and then a bit anxious probably about coming here and talking to you guys. Um, and then I got out of bed, pulling the duvet rather hard and um, stepped out of my bedroom door to fall over one of my daughter's bags. So then I started feeling really irritated with all my lazy children and wondering why I even bothered to earn a living to um, contribute to their lives. So this is kind of how it goes, isn't it? We know what our values are, maybe we don't, but um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. But our minds, our inside stuff, our thoughts and feelings and urges and images, they hijack us, don't they? And they drag us away into making a way move. So what helps with that is knowing what your values are, being in sensing mode. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And then learning to notice this stuff and to unhook from it. So the advantage I have having done lots of this training is these things I always get hooked by my thoughts and feelings, but I can notice them more quickly and start to um, what I call unhook um, from my thoughts and feelings in order to do what's important, in order to start doing something pleasurable to come out of here. So you'll be pleased to know that my husband did get a cup of tea and a morning nod, even though my inside stuff was very much telling me to put a pillow over his face. So, um, this is the deal. So just to help you for a moment clarify what your values might be. So not what, your, what was important two months ago, but what's important now in this current day, in this current climate. These are a few questions you can ask yourself now or later. What would you be doing with your time if I planted in your house a CCTV camera right now and over this next um, time of social isolation, social distancing, I get to watch pretty much every move on camera. So 
how would you like to be how would you like to be seen if you were living according to your values if you were living according to what's really important to you right now so what would you be doing how would you be treating people in your space what would you be saying and to whom and how would you be saying it what kind of tone who would you be spending time with on facetime or in person who would you be calling how much would you be moving your body to the best of your capability what might you stop doing what would you be putting in your mouth by way of food and drink so there are a few questions that will just really help you to notice and wonder about what's important. They're the questions that, if you keep those in mind, will help you to make lots more towards moves. And what we know is the more towards moves we free ourselves up to make, the more meaningful life feels. So here's a fancy car. I don't even know what that fancy car is. I think it might be a Lamborghini um fancy cars or less fancy cars like the one i've got um have gears i don't know much about cars i treat cars like the kettle i switch it on and it works and um but we i do know that we have gears and we have several gears however rubbish your car is um you'll have more than a few gears and at, at some point you'll have learnt that you have gears and that you need to change them. The more we drive, the more automatic and dangerous we get in our driving. But if I was to drive from where I live 50 miles in first gear, my engine wouldn't like that, I'm told. It would probably blow up, I probably wouldn't make the journey, and it wouldn't end well. On the other hand, if I Put, in, put my car into fifth gear and drove up my quite tiny lane um, at 50 miles an hour, I'd probably end up running someone down or crashing. So either wouldn't be great. So it's not like fifth gear is better than first gear or vice versa. It's that we need to know different gears apply to different contexts to make sure we're in the right gear at the right time. So, here's a secret that most people in Western society don't realize. Your mind, whoever you are, however flawed your mind is, whatever mental health history you have, whatever you do, you have two gears in your mind right now and wherever you are. So, most of the time, you'll be in thinking mode because we're terribly good at that. Um, what we do in thinking gear is great. So without thinking gear, you couldn't have come and sat in front of this screen this morning or whenever you're watching it. So in order to get out of bed at the right time, to get yourself organized, I guess the advantage of being in front of a screen, we don't even need to get dressed, but to get yourself at the right time, maybe to make yourself a cup of tea, switch your computer on, you needed to be in thinking mode. You needed to plan, do some mental time travel. When you're in bed, you needed to think, where do I need to be in two hours? You needed to aim for your goal. So that's fabulous that all of you who I'm talking to have thinking gear available to you. But the problem is, we're in it too much because when there's no thinking that needs to be done what then happens is thinking turns into rumination and worry and agitation and that's when we feel incredibly restless and agitated because lots of parts of our brain are lighting up if we could mri scan them in that moment that don't need to be lighting up we're overworking and we feel horrible. And what happens also when we're in thinking gear when we don't need to be is we're missing out. We're missing out on the things that are important. We're missing out on making towards moves because mostly when we're in thinking gear, inappropriately, we will be pulled away from our values like I was this morning, hijacked by our dominant inside stuff. 
So we need to be switching. We need to, first of all, know we've got another gear, which is sensing gear. And we need to learn to switch to it on purpose. So we are born in sensing gear. So if you've been born, you're all right. You have sensing gear available to you. When you look at small children, a toddler cannot be thinking, do I need to do more shopping in order to survive tomorrow? A toddler can't look to yesterday and think several more people died of this awful virus. A toddler is enjoying the piece of chocolate in its mouth, or it's watching whatever the program of the moment is, or it's looking very carefully and curiously at a spider or a leaf. You can watch toddlers and see them doing that. But as we grow up, as language develops, we get pulled out of our sensing mode to the point where our default mode is thinking. And that's why there's catastrophic amounts of stress in this world before we even got to the point of um, a COVID virus. So how do you then get into sensing gear? Well, I'm gonna show you in that in a moment, but right now you're probably in it. So right now, if you're staring at a screen intently and listening to me, you're using two of your senses. So if you're even using one of your senses pretty wholeheartedly, you're in sensing mode. And your body is a doorway into sensing mode. So as long as your body's with you, you can always go into sensing mode. Whether you're standing in a queue when we finally get out of lockdown, or whether you're talking to your child or your partner, you have an ability to switch into sensing mode. Do you recognize this? These are people that would be better off being in sensing mode, but are actually in thinking mode. That's a lot of us a lot of the time. So, first of all, just know you've got these two gears and that you can switch. Because if you're in thinking mode when you shouldn't be, you're gonna be much more likely, like this lady, to be hijacked by your inside thoughts of um, what's gonna happen, memories, futuring, and anxiety, and be pulled into doing things that isn't your ideal self, or just feeling really agitated and unwell. So I wanna take you into sensing gear. Um, in order to do that, it would be much better if you can close your eyes if you're willing to do that, just so you don't get distracted. So just kind of close your eyes and start by um, thinking, um, just noticing what noises you can hear. And then see if you can notice even quieter noises. And then just take a bit of a sniff and notice if you can smell anything. And then notice your whole posture in your chair from the top of your head to your feet. Now your mind might then jump in and say, well, I can't feel aspects of my body. Just notice that your mind is saying that and notice the bits of your body that you can. Notice the position of your hands. Notice whether you can feel anything under your fingers or the absence of any feeling. Notice what you can see behind your closed eyes, that perhaps it's not dark like you expect. There'll be patterns of light there. Just see if you can notice that. And then notice that you are actually breathing and notice which parts of your body are moving as you breathe. Notice your shoulders and your stomach and your chest. Notice the air going in through your nose. And then just again, pay attention to the noise and see if any noises have changed. And then most importantly, notice there's this point of view that's noticing. So you're not the sounds, you're not the taste in your mouth even, you're not even your breathing. There's a weird part of you that we don't even have a good word for that is able to stand back and notice stuff. And if you can notice anything at all, you're in sensing mode. 
Our minds are very flawed and they spend a lot of time trying to drag us out. And I'm sure your mind will be saying, am I doing this right? Maybe it's not um, like everybody else. Maybe I can't do this. But that shows that you're in sensing mode and that your inside stuff is trying to challenge you and pull you away. So just kind of notice that you can notice. And the more we strengthen that part of you, the better you'll be and the more likely it is you can make towards moves. And then when you're ready, just come back to the room. So if you were here with me, I'd ask you what that was like, what you noticed. And you might say, I noticed the birds. I noticed that my feet were a bit restless. So if you're able to say, I noticed, then you're in sensing mode for at least a few seconds. And that's a great start. So here's some ways you can get into sensing mode today in the next hour after we finish. So you can listen. You can focus on a body part where you can feel yourself breathing or another body part. If you're able, you can push your feet down. If not, you can push your fingers together or shrug your shoulders. You can notice through your eyes. Even if you can't see very much, you can notice what your vision is like. Even if you've got double vision, be curious about that, really notice it. Or you can find something incredibly essential like a big piece of chocolate and you can put that in your mouth and you can really taste and smell and experience the chocolate. As most of the time we don't, we just shove it in our mouths more and more each time. We don't enjoy it and it can lead us to um, what would be away moves, not looking after our physical health. So each time you bring your full senses or one of them to something, you're doing a mental sit up. One good way of noticing when you're in thinking gear, when you don't need to be, is if you're in the past. So any memories or regrets, images about anything other than this moment, you're in your mind TARDIS, dipping off to another time zone. You're not in the now, you're not using your senses, you're in your head. And if you're doing futuring, planning, worrying, fearing, then you're in your mental TARDIS. You're not in sensing mode. So get better at noticing that and just saying out loud, I'm in my mental TARDIS. If you live with other people, best to say it in your head. Um, but if not, you can say it out loud and that's good. Or stick a picture of a TARDIS on your fridge and in other places um, just to remind you, where am I? Note to yourself, am I in my head, am I in my TARDIS, or am I in sensing mode? Can I shift on purpose? So once I consulted a personal trainer, just once, many years ago, and for some reason at the time, I wanted to have a strong core, a six pack. Um, and he told me how to do it. He told me how to do it, and he actually showed me how to do it. And I came out of his um, gym, and I never did it and actually decided that I didn't really want one, it wouldn't add to the quality of my life. So um, can you notice the spelling mistake in that sentence? Had you noticed? Um, so there you go, you've just slipped into sensing mode um, and noticed that. I didn't do those sit-ups, and every time you notice something, a spelling mistake, a sound, your feet, your breathing, you've done one mental sit up. So you have potential by the end of this lockdown to have a very strong mind, mind six pack, which will do you more favors in many ways than staying physically well. Um, because if we have a strong mind, um, it helps us with stress. And every time you do a mind sit up, your mind will get better at that. We've actually shown on MRI scans, it changes your neurology. It improves your attention. Um, it strengthens those part of the brain that help us solve problems. And every time you do a mind sit up by noticing something, you will be more easily able to shift gear, stay there more longer um, and feel less stressed. So the problem at the moment is not only are we on lockdown, but so is the thoughts and feelings monster inside of us. So he's really bored too. And he's spending a lot of time 
in a battle, in a tug of war with many human beings, trying to drag them into a way me. So that's the only thing that amuses him in social isolation, is seeing humans slip into being the people they don't really want to be. And when we're fighting to get rid of thoughts and feelings, it's like that picture we're kind of, look at that poor man's face. Um, he's in so much mental pain. He's in so much, um, he's high levels of fatigue. I mean, you would be, wouldn't you, if you're doing that all day with your thoughts and feelings, trying not to slip into the pit of despair. So we haven't got huge amounts of time, but I just wanna show you a couple of techniques that you can do to actually be willing to have thoughts and feelings. Notice them, name them, acknowledge them. Because actually, that's what helps us to drop this rope. The only power that this man has is to drop the rope. All the time he keeps pulling, he's gonna be exhausted and he can't sit down and write, read a novel. He can't have a nice chat with his partner. He can't phone a friend because he's too busy trying to get rid of the thoughts and feelings monster. Can you see that? So, here's a technique, quite bizarre, quite counterintuitive, but there's a lot of people right now in the world that their darkest thought is, I am going to get this virus. That hijacks us into a mind train that takes us into, then I'll get really ill, then my MS will get worse, then I'll die, then I'll leave my family. We can be at the funeral parlor before we've even kind of, you know, been there two minutes. So instead of battling to get rid of that so what we naturally do is we run away from it we start distracting ourselves we throw some food into our mouths we have a glass of wine we shout at our family um, we start doing frantic exercise we've all got our things haven't we to avoid our emotions um, so instead of doing that we're just going to write it on a piece of paper so if you have one get a piece of paper make it landscape if you haven't, just kind of listen and, and do this at a later time. So on a piece of paper, works best if you put it in the right bottom corner, write, I'm going to get the virus. Write it slowly. Allow yourself to notice it. And then just have a look at that thought that maybe you've been avoiding and just notice what it brings up in your body. Maybe it makes your heart race a bit, understandably. Just notice that. Notice where you can feel anxiety in your body. Allow it to be there. Be willing to have it. Drop the rope. And then what I want you to do now is to write this sentence in front of it. I am having the thought that I'm going to get the virus. And just notice that. Might make you more anxious. We're not trying to get rid of experiences. We're trying to notice them, wake up to them. So I'm just gonna ask George, as I saw that he was doing that, what was the impact of um, adding that sentence, writing it down? Oh, well, oh. So, so the first part of I'm having the thought that made me feel a bit more relaxed once you introduce that particular line. Kind of just, it. yeah, it diminishes the power perhaps a little bit. So for some people it does that. These are tools, you can play around with them. For some people it doesn't do that. So just have a play. But for a lot of people that will diminish the power of that thought, gives you a bit more wiggle room to go and do something important. So now try adding this. I noticed that. And then add that whole sentence in your head. I noticed that. I'm having the thought that. I'm going to get the virus. And again, for a lot of people that might not work, but for, for many, many people, it just diminishes that tight pull on the rope. It gives you a little bit of slack. So at least you can have something to eat or talk to somebody or watch an interesting film whilst holding that rope more lightly. So have a go at it. I can do this now whilst driving or talking to somebody um, or writing an academic paper. But for a while, when I was first learning, I had to always do it on paper and sometimes several times. Um, so it requires practice. It's a skill. The first time I picked up a guitar, I couldn't play it. And I can't play it now because I haven't practiced that skill. So these are skills that need practicing. Every time you have a thought that you notice, 
if you're in sensing mode, you'll notice your thoughts, write it down and, and play about with that. Have a go at this. So some people are calling it COVID, um, some people are calling it coronavirus, so whatever you're calling it, your mind is shouting this and we spend a lot of time trying not to process it. So here again is something different to drop that rope, say it over and over again. And I'm going to invite my panel to help me with this because otherwise I feel very weird. So with me, just for a few seconds, repeat this word over and over again, do it in a silly voice, make it fast, make it slow. Um, start now, say coronavirus, 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 corona, 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 virus, 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 corona, 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 die, 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 corona, corona, corona. Right. It feels very strange doing that in front of a, a screen. It's much better when I use big audiences and then we can play about together. But you might notice that when you now say that out loud, corona, just feels a little bit less scary, a little bit more of a word, like a normal kind of word. So again, you can play about with that. If you live on your own or on your own, you can say it out loud, shout it, whisper it, say it in a Mickey Mouse voice. It just seems to diminish the power of these words in our heads. At the end of the day, that's what they are, a word in our head. Um, you can write it out like old fashioned lines, I'm gonna get corona or just the word, you can decorate it. You can do this with your children. It's a very helpful skill to teach children as young as possible. Put some eyes on it, decorate it, do it in different colors, different pens, have a go. Um, once you start to spend more time in sensing mode, you'll notice your thoughts more often. And that's what we need to do to protect our minds. When you notice a thought, I'm gonna die, I can't cope with this, everyone else is doing better, you can just ask yourself, is that a helpful thought to me right now? Is it helping me in any way to be more like my values? Probably not. If not, you can try one of these techniques or you can just focus on something important like reading or phoning somebody or watching something useful. Ask yourself, if I believe this thought as the absolute truth, how does it make me feel or act towards myself or others? So we're not asking, is this true? We're not arguing with it. We're not trying to find counter arguments. We're just asking, is this helping me right now in this moment? Might help me this evening, but is it helping me right now? Mostly it won't be. So this is a bit mean when none of us can go on a plane. Um, I'd really like to be flying off to Spain right now and looking for a sunbed, but hey ho. But when you go on a plane, they'll show you a card or they'll tell you verbally that if there's a crisis, you first need to put on your own oxygen mask before you can help anyone else. Often in times of crisis, our minds get even more bullying. They're pretty bullying most of the time, actually, for most of us. But when we're hurting, upset or frightened, our minds can get even more unkind and their tone changes to something that's really harsh and unpleasant. So my mind says, you know, get a grip, kind of all your colleagues are doing all right, you're a psychologist for goodness sake, man up, sort it out, stop being pathetic. Um, and that just really isn't very helpful. It makes me feel anxious, it makes me feel sad, it makes me feel inad inadequate. My large not good enough story that we've all got gets very loud and grumpy. So just see if you can notice that bully and, and speak to it as if you'd speak to your children or somebody very immature when they're squabbling. Just say, be kind. Yeah, that's not very nice. Don't, don't say it, don't be like that. And, and do something you would do for a good friend. Be a better mate to yourself, be a better friend. Make yourself a mug of hot chocolate, run yourself a bath, um, grab a, a good novel to read. Do something that takes you towards your values um, rather than beat yourself up and you'll start to feel better. And when you start to feel better, you can then show others compassion. So on, um, just to finish off, we're gonna do what I call a pod. You can do this lots of times in the day. The more you do it, the more it will help. So just kind of pause right now. 
Notice your stomach. Watch it going in and out. Notice what's going on for you right now in this moment. Where are you? What's your body feeling like? And then decide, what do I actually need right now? Maybe I need to get up if my posture has been a bit stuck. Maybe I need to drink a bit of water if I'm dehydrated. Maybe I need to phone my friend and check in with her. But all the time we're running around, not noticing what gear we're on, on autopilot, we're gonna be constantly dragged into making away moves, running away from our feelings, not doing what's in our best interests, not doing any self care that will give us the best chance of staying well. So one of the things you might decide is to go and watch some television, read a good book. So on that note, I've written you a novel, especially for this time. This was published in November. What an amazing title, given I didn't know what we were heading for. Surviving Me. Isn't that what we've got to do? Most of all, we've got to survive ourselves in this crisis. My novel is about two men who listen too hard to their minds when their mind shouts loud dark stories and um, certainly in the UK it's on Kindle for two, two pounds um, during this, this um, crisis. And then here's some other what I hope will be helpful resources, they're all very practical and accessible. Um, I would flag up particularly the sleep book, um, although the more time you spend in the day in sensing mode, the less problem you'll have with sleep. There's a great app called The Act Companion, The Happiness Trap by a man called Russ Harris. And it's usually seven pound, but it's currently free. I would really encourage you to download it. It gives you great ideas to connect with your values and unhook from your thoughts and feelings monster. Thank you very much for your attention. It's lovely to virtually meet all of you. And I trust that that's been of some help. Um, best wishes, stay well. That was excellent. It's now time to pass over to George, please. Thanks, Jeremy, and thank you, Joe. It's a brilliant talk and just a, a real reminder that we need to take care of ourselves. So thank you very much. Um, so Atman, as, as we all know, you know, the MS of patient community is, you know, we're incredibly anxious right now. And um, we've seen it on the Shift MS forum and over our various social channels, MSs, and I very much include myself in that, are, you know, we're concerned about what the coronavirus might mean to us. And it's a difficult time for us all. Um, like in, in our household, um, we're finding it a real challenge to fit in two full-time jobs, homeschooling a five-year-old and trying to keep a two-year-old entertained. But that's nowhere near as tough as it is for those who have lost their income or those who are on the front line in hospitals around the world right now. And I suppose each and every one of us is experiencing our own challenges. Um, and we've got, we've got to look after ourselves and support each other where we can. In advance of this call today, we were looking through the questions that have been submitted um, and there have been you know, a huge amount on treatment, which Jeremy's already referred to. Um, but there's also some practical concerns that people with MS have, such as you know, how to manage relapses during this time, impact on routine MS appointments, you know, how, how treatment monitoring works when we're told to avoid hospitals, and what happens to those who aren't receiving their regular face-to-face -face care and support due to lockdown. I don't know. And spare thought for those who are stuck in diagnosis limbo land right now. What a difficult time it must be for them. So it is, it is a tough time for us all. Um, at Shift.ms, I suppose our response to COVID-19 has been to, I suppose, firstly, inform MSs through the latest information and expert knowledge. And we try and provide responses to MSs' individual questions regarding the pandemic. And we've released, I think, four video interviews now with Professor Gavin Giovanoni from the UK and also Aaron Boster in the US over the last couple of weeks, which I think have had over 45,000 views, which is incredible. Um, Shift Almas launched a campaign, also launched a programme two weeks ago called COVID Companions, which is a, essentially about Shift Almas pairing two people living with MS who are living in isolation with each other to provide peer support at this time. If you're interested, please take a look. And we're also launching a suite of tools to help MSs keep their minds active and occupied at this time. Um, you can find all of Shift.ms's COVID-19 specific support at shift.ms forward slash COVID-19. 
and that's all one word um but my kind of personal take on, on my personal advice on the situation is you know many of us might be in isolation but if you can in any way you can please try and stay connected try to have you know re regular interactions over video calls over you know whatever means makes sense to you with friends with colleagues with families with neighbors you know, try and speak to others around you and also get support from fellow MSs. It always amazes me how supportive we are as a community, you know, with, with others who are going through similar situations to ourselves. I think so many of us are here to support each other. Um, so yeah, please lean on us when you need us. I found it, you know, last three weeks working from home, I found building, building structure into my day, building particularly, particularly important. So no matter whether you're employed or what your family situation might be, um, I really recommend structure and routine can really help at these times. Um, but as Jo so eloquently put, and I don't want to butcher any of her talk, but you know, we, we need to look after ourselves and we need to ensure that we have time for ourselves each day. And if, if only for a, a brief moment, because at times it feels that's all we've got, um, make sure you have some time for you, you know, to look after your mind, to look, to look after our bodies and to have time to find that, that sensing gear that Jo tells us about. But I suppose finally for me, there's a post that someone, that, that um, a member left on the Shift.ms forum last week that made a real impact on me and many others. And I'll, I'm going to paraphrase if that's okay. It talks about how MSs are actually very well equipped to deal with the coronavirus outbreak. Compared to the rest of the population, MSs are all used to, firstly, being stuck in limbo. We, we, you know, nobody can tell us how long this will last living with uncertainty. We all know only too well that nobody can predict what the future holds for us and what, the, what to plan, and we have to plan as best we can, but always live in the present. We're used to listening to our bodies and struggling to decide whether our latest symptom is something to be worried about or not. You know, we're familiar with trying to interpret complicated, evolving, and occasionally conflicting medical advice. We appreciate that there's general guidance, but each of us have to make our own choices based on our own personal circumstances and our own assessment to risk. You know, many of us are familiar with self-isolating and adapting kind of good hygiene practices to avoid infection. We acknowledge that bad things happen that are outside of our control. We belong to a community that do not rely on regular face-to-face -face contact. We do our best to maintain our sense of humour. And I suppose most importantly, we're used to building resilience. And that's very much an important factor right now. And finishes her post by saying, coronavirus, everything is relative. MSs, keep calm. I think it's safe to say we've got this one. So I found those words, yeah, they really hit home to me. So if you'd like to read more, the full post is on the Shift MS site. But yeah, just a special thanks to Joe, to Jeremy, and to Ruth for being part of this panel session, and for Sarah and the New Academy for organising. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. So we now got a, a few minutes for to answer some questions, and um, we've picked out a few of these, these these questions first. And I'd like to come to you, Ruth, to start with. So uh, one of the questions was, what exercises? can I do during this lockdown period to ensure I don't get weaker? I'm still quite mobile, but I can feel myself getting weaker from inactivity. Hi everyone, um, that's an excellent question and I've had that from quite a few patients already. I have spoken to my colleagues, I work within a community neuro rehab team, um, and I spoke to one of my colleagues <clears throat> who's a neurophysio this morning, um, she said there's some excellent advice and actually videos that you can use at home on the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. Um, and that's, they've been put there since the crisis, so uh, really helpful. The MS Society and the MS Trust pages. And also, as George has been saying, I found that a lot of my patients have found Shift MS to be really helpful in sharing ideas and information and, and kind of where to go about looking after yourself. <clears throat> As the question says, it's really important during this time to keep doing this as much as possible. Thank you. Can I, can I stick with you, Ruth, and ask you a second question? <coughs> which is, um, 
I'm due back from maternity leave. Is it true I have to give two months notice? Secondly, I'm a vulnerable person. How can I go back to work when I have an eight month old? Is there financial support for me? So with regard to the notice periods, I, I don't feel that we should be able to give you that advice, but I would go to acas.org.uk and that has specific advice that has been updated since the crisis about what your, the role of your employer is. Um, if you have any specific concerns like this, if you can contact your MS team, I do appreciate that some are in transit or quite you know, busy trying to, to catch up with, with what, how their response is to this crisis. But um, so definitely go to acas.org.uk, try and get hold of your team. The MS Society has um, really good website pages on financial help. And again, it breaks it down into all the different areas, so it will have advice on this. Um, and also the Department for Work and Pensions, uh, they have uh, basically the role of your employer um, with protecting patients who are high risk. And so with regard to whether you are, should be shielding or self-isolating, again, it's back to what Jeremy was saying, that, that guidance has been posted by Gavin. Um, and I'm sure will be available on the, on the websites. And again, shift MS, share information. Thank you. Now there's a question that I think is very relevant to you, Joe, um, and that you've covered a little bit in your talk, but actually this, this I think is a, an exemplar for uh, how to take forward your, some of your work and your recommendations. So, Question is, with the coronavirus, my anxiety and stress are affecting my sleep. I can't calm my mind down at night. My doctor has me on drugs which do not work when my mind is racing. I'm not sleeping and, and I have feelings of fatigue and off balance during the day. What can I do to help myself? Okay. Yeah, I'd really like to reiterate. I, the problem for you and for loads and loads of other people i would say 90 percent of the population with or without ms um, is they don't know they've got a sensing mode so they're not practicing it they're not strengthening it they have a very weak mental six pack in terms of um unhooking from difficult thoughts and feelings so when you're really good at something so if you're over 15 and you've practiced thinking mode for decades um you're very good at it so when you lie down um you're still practicing thinking mode and you're doing it incredibly well so if your challenge was to think a million thoughts every minute then you're probably getting quite close to that olympic goal but if you actually want to get some sleep and in enjoy life um, it's not such a great expertise so every day just start to strengthen your sensing um, mood and as I say um, we've got some really exciting MRI evidence now that the more you do sensing um, the more the better you'll feel the better you'll sleep and on one of my practical resources at the end of my presentation there's a, a book by Guy Meadows there's lots of YouTube videos by him he works in the same model that I do acceptance and commitment therapy which is in my opinion the best model of psychological therapy for people with MS and everybody else um, and it gives you some really good tips about how to specifically apply these principles to sleeping but practice sensing made as much as you can thank you um, I, I've got the book and it's excellent good so uh, another question for you Ruth if I may if we aren't taking a DMT currently are we to stay at home for 12 weeks? And this person uh, was due to start ocrelizumab, but that is now on hold. Hi, every <clears throat> Hi everyone. That's an interesting question. Um, and I guess part of it is if you can talk to your local MS team, I'm very much aware that we have some international um, listeners as well, not just from the UK. If you can speak to your, um, your team, <clears throat> then that would be great. Um, obviously, the, the categories for shielding, um, self-isolating and social isolating are online. There is a lot of confusion around this and I totally understand that it's, it's quite difficult. 
basically the main answer is that it's, it's probably unlikely to do with your MS that you would potentially need to isolate unless um, you have a significant disability, uh, in, in which case that's a conversation with the MS team. If it is a comorbidity, then I would signpost back to the GP to discuss with them whether there's another reason that you might need to um, follow any other 12 week. But the shielding category is very much a combination of self-isolation and actually um, self-isolating from your family within the home. So it, there is a difference. So do go to gov.uk um, and also the NHS 111 have a, they've opened up a specific section for advice around the coronavirus and those different categories. Thank you. And I think all those websites and links will be available via the MS Academy, will they, Sarah? They will. So um, a question for you, George, I think this is, um, lots of MSs have comorbidities. Neurologists don't understand my other diagnoses and my other docs don't understand my MS. I'm concerned if I get COVID-19, the docs won't understand my mobility, my comorbidities. Do you have any advice for me? So this is around how to, how to manage the communications of the various people you may be under. What would you say? Yes, it's tough. Um, I think for that individual, um, I think it's really important that they kind of almost take charge of being the central point of all the communications. So they have the various documents. They are in charge of letting each of the different healthcare professionals know what the other ones are saying. So I think they should very much act as that central point um, and just to keep them updated. Um, I, think it's, I think it's really tough, but I, th I think it's more than ever, it's on, kind of on the MS themselves to actually be able to coordinate the communication between the different healthcare professionals. I, I would, would agree. As someone who, who tries um, to manage, I think if you are the gatekeeper for your information and you help the clinicians to come together, then actually that's a really important role for um, you to play. And don't underestimate the, the complexities and the difficulties of, of working in an environment where notes and information is messy and people aren't necessarily copied in on things, whereas you can be that person. So um, before we move to summing up, I, I'd just like to, to um, address very briefly some of the issues that have come up. And quite rightly, people are asking very specific questions about specific treatments. Uh, and I would strongly advise you to go to Gavin Giovanoni's microsite, which is there's a link at the um, at the academy website for this, because Gavin Gavin has done a systematic question and answers response, and. I think rather than, than me talk individually about some of these things, I would really recommend you use that as a, as a place to go to for information drugs and specific circumstances. So, on that note, I'd like to ask the individual members of the panel to sum up. We'll go to Jo last, because she's just going to reiterate some of the issues around um, mental health. So, can I start with you, Ruth? to sum up some of your key recommendations for people listening. I guess from, from our point of view, and thank you again for you know, dialing in today, from our point of view, do use the online resources for general information about coronavirus, there's the NHS site and gov.uk. If, if you're concerned about um, any symptoms that you think might be to do with the MS, and I totally understand from speaking to patients that sometimes it it can be quite difficult to decide which, but do use the MS Society, the MS Trust, do join up to shift um, MS and look on the Neurology Academy and, and maybe have a look back over this, this um, video. Um, if you can contact your local team, I understand with our international callers, there may be different um, set up. So again, use the MS uh, charities, the, the, you know, the national MS charities, there is, in some areas, a local MS Society support group, so do contact them. Um, and then, yeah, so as I said, in the, in the local area, do contact your local MS Society groups. They're often incredibly supportive. Um, but do call your local MS teams. We are, we are coming out from 
the initial wave to a certain extent. So we are there to, to support you. Okay. George, can I come to you for some key points? So yeah, closing thoughts. Um, I mean, it's, it's a difficult time for us all. So I think just us all to acknowledge that and be okay with that, I think is really important. Um, the more we can do to support each other, the better. Mm. Um, there's plenty of platforms out there where we can do that. And the, the program which I mentioned earlier, which is called COVID Companions and can be found at shift.ms forward slash COVID-19 is a place for MSers to support each other through video calls. I'd really encourage you to sign up to that. Um, and as Joe, and I'm sure we'll hear in a moment, it's so important that we take care of our mind. But yeah, take care people and be safe. Thank you. And just before coming to you, Joe, I, I'll give you my sum up. Um, I agree, this is a really tough time. There's huge uncertainty. There are ch different guidances and changing guidances. I think there are, for me, there are three things. Safety first. If you're struggling with the guidance, always go for a more safer option. Mm -hmm. Secondly, keep yourself informed. So uh, issues about awareness, websites, being up to date with the recommendations and those changing recommendations, I think, are really important. And thirdly, in terms of the, the management of your own MS, then uh, liaising with your team and using Shift MS and other groups is unbelievably important. So those would be my three points. So finally, to you, Joe, to um, give your closing thoughts and a summary. Okay. Thank you for listening. Best wishes to everyone. Um, I would suggest you really take this time to clarify your values because actually this was really important before all of this started and lots of people aren't doing that. So really take the time to write out what and who is important. If you have family, do it together. Um, go back to my CCTV questions to remind you. Um, practice being in sensing mode. It's really hard because we've got so good at being in thinking mode. But every time you notice something, that's a mental six pack. So you could end up at the end of lockdown with a massive win because you could have a stronger mind than you had before lockdown. And that will actually help you in every aspect for the rest of your life. So you might be glad of it. Um, and finally, you know, drop the rope with that thoughts and feelings monster practice the techniques that enable you to be willing to have thoughts and feelings by just kind of noticing them naming them acknowledging them so even like george has just done being able to say this is really hard everybody's struggling i'm struggling this is anxiety i'm feeling really worried and concerned or I'm having the thought that I'm truly going mad. That's my regular morning one. Okay, bye-bye, thank you. So, it uh, falls to me to thank my panel members for their um, thoughts and their interactions, and particularly for Joe Johnson for um, leading us through some key approaches to mental health issues. A big thank you again to the MS Academy and Sarah for their um, unbelievably good support for people with MS and this will be the first of many different website um, webcasts and web links and uh, webinars for you to uh, participate in and update your information and finally um, stay safe in what is a very difficult time thank you very much for listening thank you everybody take care and stay safe Bye.